We're on level three, lesson 11, condensed version. I am loved, I am pretty. I am loved, I am pretty. Praise God. Actually, this lesson, I'm loved, I am pretty, is in the uh, 34 lesson discipleship book. If you have one of those, it's somewhere in there. And actually, the test that you took, uh, the Joe Rose story, is in the 34 lesson discipling 101 book as well. So, uh, anyway, some of you said that you liked the test. Some of you, oh, some of you didn't take the test. Okay. <laughs> What test? All right. You need to go see Lois about your test. Level three, lesson 11. I am loved. I am pretty. This actually came about. This is a true story that came about from an experience uh, here at CBC. A couple of the students that were here in CBC were interacting, and I somehow got involved in this interaction, and it was brought to my attention, so I just wrote this little discipleship lesson concerning the interaction of two CBC students. So be careful what you do around me. You may be in the next discipleship tool. Amen? Amen. So let's read and see what happened here. It said, One day Michael came into my office to tell me some very confidential information. about one of his fellow students. As I was lecturing, as I was lecturing in one of my sessions at the Bible college, it appeared that Patricia was writing herself some notes on a legal pad. Her notes contained these statements. I am loved, I am pretty. I am loved, I am pretty. I am loved, I am pretty. You know, some of you, what they call doodle through your classes. Sometimes, you know, you draw pictures and you, you know, all of this, all that kind of things. Well, so Patricia was writing this, I am loved, I am pretty, I am loved, I am pretty. Patricia was also the kind of person that dressed in a way that brought attention to herself. The real reason that Patricia expressed these words was the fact that she didn't feel loved, she didn't feel pretty, and in fact, she felt rejected and unloved. You know, a lot of times we do a lot of things because we really want to love, because all of us want to be loved and we want to be valued. We want to feel special. And when we don't go to God for that kind of love, then we usually try to get it through people. And, uh, and if you're female, it may appear in your dress or lack of dress, I should say or whatever, to try to get some kind of a attention. But usually the attention that we get through those means of not trying, not getting those needs met through Christ um, end up to be disastrous in our life, um, in our relationships, or in our future. And so paragraph number two, I say here, as humans, we all have the same basic needs the desire to be loved, to be accepted, to be valued, as well as having a sense of self-worth and also knowing that we're right with God. A lot of religion today makes us feel unloved, not valued, and not accepted. And one of the greatest strongholds that Satan uses against the believer is the feeling of guilt and condemnation while all along making us feel quite spiritual about it. I know that in my younger life, in my younger part of Christianity, although it was a wonderful time of my life, uh, I always felt in the church circles that I was in at that time, I always felt the more condemned I felt, the more sin conscious I felt, the more beat down I felt by and the more sin that's pointed out to me that 
the more spiritual uh, I felt the service was. You know, the more people that came to the altar, the more people that felt bad, you know, about their lives, that uh, this is where the Spirit of God was really, really moving. And uh, it's only later in my life as, as I've studied the Word of God that I find that one of the greatest tools of the enemy is, re- is really guilt. And we talked about this in our last lesson. Or whether it's, if it's true guilt, then we need to, uh, let's just say this, forgiveness um, is something, when we receive forgiveness, we have to also acknowledge, along with forgiveness, that we're guilty. We've done something in violation to, to God's law and to God's principles. We need forgiveness. But there's a lot of things in Christianity that is false guilt, okay? And, and it's not good for our health. It's not good for our, our, our emotional health, our physical health, our spiritual life. And uh, so I believe that Satan uses guilt and condemnation uh, and makes us feel quite spiritual about it. Back to paragraph number three. Here's the question. How many of you, when you first came to Jesus, were told that not only did he love you, but by accepting him, by confessing him, Lord of your life, that he would become your perfect righteousness, all the righteousness that you'd ever need. In fact, the righteousness he would supply would be all the righteousness that you would ever need. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says in but of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is made into his wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And part of the good news of the gospel of the new covenant is that Jesus has been made into me righteousness. He's my righteousness. Even under the old covenant, one of God's names was the Lord, our righteousness. This is the good news of the gospel. Listen to this. Romans 1, 16 and 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. It says here, I'm not ashamed of the good news of Christ. It's the power of God to bring salvation into you to everyone that believes For therein, within the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. Within the law, sin is revealed. Within the gospel, righteousness is revealed. Two different things, two different aspects, two different things that God uses. The law will bring guilt, condemnation, show us our sin. But the gospel will bring the righteousness of God, the life of God, uh, the redeeming work of God, bringing us into a perfect relationship with God. The law was meant to bring us to Christ, and once we come to Christ, no longer are we to live under that other means. Amen? That's not to say we're not to repent and do things like this. We are to do those things, but I'm just talking about in our, in our normal life, We have a relationship with God where God is our friend. We talked about Hebrews chapter 10, in which there should be no more consciousness of sin. What does that mean? In other words, your focus on sin should not be the norm of your Christian life. Your focus on Christ should be the norm of your Christian life. Romans chapter 4, verse 5, To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies, makes righteous, ungodly people, his faith is counted for righteousness. God did not call us to have faith in faith or faith for stuff, but a confident, reliant, dependent trust in him for everything. God can't love you any more than he already does because he is love, 1 John 4, 8. So he can't love you more than he already does for God is love. But you know what? You can love a person, but if that person doesn't believe that you love them, it doesn't matter how much they love you. It is not going to profit the person at all. But you can receive more of it, more of God's love. You can feel it more. You can experience it more. The more you believe it, 
the more you will find yourself loving God. The scripture says this in 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. When we believe in his love for us, we will love him. Think about this. Believe this. Receive this. Now let's go to our questions. You'll turn with me to, over to your questions. I'm going to start with question number two and skip number one because question number one, question number 10, 11, 12, and 13 all deal with Romans chapter 8. And so I'm going to wait till, till the last to, to, and just deal with those verses and deal with those questions at the end. So I'm going to start with question number two today. And it says this. It says, when I was in Bible college, speaking about me, when I was in Bible college, I had a professor who passed out uh, some notes that stated this, and I quote. These are his notes. It says, justification is the judicial act whereby God declares righteous anyone who believes, not makes righteous. End of quote. Justification is the, is the judicial act whereby God declares someone righteous who believes, not makes them righteous. In modern Protestant theology, that is an accepted definition for justification. Almost anywhere you would turn, you would find that that is an accepted definition for justification. But I go ahead and state this. As I studied the scriptures for myself, I became convinced that justification is a gift of righteousness that makes you righteous in God's sight. Let's turn over today to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And let's look at verse 18, first of all. First of all, Romans chapter 5 is a powerful chapter, but it's very hard to understand in our King James Version because of the wording. But really, it's a contrast between what Adam did and what Christ did. And Adam's sin and the effect upon humanity and Christ's obedience and the effect on humanity. It says in verse 18, Therefore, as by the offense of one judgment came upon all men into condemnation, so through the offense of Adam, through his sin, judgment came upon all of humanity, resulting in condemnation, judgment, guilty, separation from God for all eternity. Even so, by the righteousness of one, this is by Jesus Christ, even by Jesus' righteousness, the righteousness of one, his obedience, going to the cross, obeying the law, perfect in spirit and letter, was able to be our substitute by going to the cross. So by the righteousness of one, this is by Jesus Christ, the free gift came then, the free gift came upon all men, resulting in justification of life, resulting in righteousness, resulting in, in men being made righteous before God. This free gift came upon all men in Christ. Justification. That explains it a little more now in verse 19. Romans chapter 5 and verse 19, it says this. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by Adam's disobedience, we were all made sinners. You know, this goes back to original sin. Original sin doesn't mean the very first act of sin. Original sin means the effect of sin, the effect of this sin that Adam did, the effect on, on the human race. And it says, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. In sin, my mother conceived me. A young person doesn't need to be taught how to sin. So by Adam's disobedience, many were made sinners. And here's what God did in Christ. So by the obedience of one, 
so by the obedience of Jesus Christ shall many be made righteous. Notice what it says here about justification here. Justification is by the obedience of one, actually a righteousness that's outside of you, the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself, by his righteousness, by his obedience, by what he accomplished, by what he did, many are going to be made righteous. It's not an imaginary righteousness. It's not saying that you're righteous when you're not righteous. It's not declaring you something that you're not. It's stating something that you are because of the redemptive work of Christ. You have been made righteous, made right, made accepted in the beloved, in Christ. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might be shown or might increase, be shown for what it is. But where sin abounded, where sin increased, grace did much more abound. Okay. That as sin hath reigned resulting in death, even so might grace reign through this righteousness that God gives us unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace did much more abound by the gift of righteousness. I'm going to go back to question number two. It says, when I was in Bible college, I had a professor who passed out some notes, and this is what it stated. Justification is the judicial act whereby God declares righteous anyone who believes, not making them righteous, but declaring them righteous. As I studied the scripture for myself, I became convinced that justification is a gift of righteous that makes you righteous in God's sight. Read Romans 5.19. Through Jesus' obedience of him keeping the law, of him going to the cross, many will be A, declared righteous, B, thought to be righteous, or C, made righteous. Made righteous. Question number three, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. If you'll turn there with me in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at verse 17. If any man be in Christ, he is declared to be or considered to be a new creation. Old things are passed away or considered to be passed away. And behold, all things are considered or declared to become new. Second Corinthians 5.17. No, that's not what it says. It says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. I think the struggle that the reformers had and that we all have is to look at us, first of all, in, in our humanity and then to look at us, secondly, from God's point of view. The struggle is that we look, our, look at ourselves in humanity and we see that we have faults. We see that we come short. Okay, and so we embrace that as being the truth instead of embracing the redemptive act that's in Christ Jesus that brings a new truth or brings the truth and nullifies the old truth. All right. I was in Adam, but now I'm in Christ. I was dead in trespasses and sins, but I am now alive. I was dead in sin, but now I've been risen with him. I was in union to Adam, but now I'm in union with Christ. I now was in Adam, but now I'm in Christ and Christ is in me. I was a sinner, but now I've been made righteous.
And I, I believe it, it's not just in your spirit. Okay? I mean, it's easier to understand when we say, well, you've made, been made right, righteous in your spirit, but your flesh goes out and does this and that and that and that. But I really believe that when God made us righteous or made us right in His sight through our faith in Christ, that in God's sight, we've been made right. Not part of us made right. We've been made right. Am I saying that I don't sin? No, I'm not saying that I don't sin. I'm just saying even when I fail and I do sin, I'm still right in God's sight, not in my wife's sight, not in your husband's sight, not in your friend's sight, but in God's sight. Am I saying that we shouldn't repent? No. Am I saying we should not confess our sins? No. I'm not saying any of those things, but I'm saying that God is dealing with me by my faith in Him rather than by my works and the things that I can do or not do. Think of it. Think of it as a little child. A little child wants to respond. I'm talking about a little, little child. Wants to respond to their parents. But you know, in the process of doing that, they might do a lot of goofy things and things that are not uh, really, in a sense, if we looked at it in a, from a perfectionistic way, we'd say that's not acceptable. But what do we do as parents? We look at the, we look at the child's heart. Amen? God looks upon the heart. And God sees our faith in Him and our, our trust in Him. And He deals with us in that, in that manner. If he dealt with us in our, on our works or by our works or by our performance or something like this, you know what? If he turned up the knob or the microscope so that we could really see some of our motives and some of the things that we do, some of our uh, behavior uh, patterns or whatever, you know, we would, we would be looking really bad. All right? Am I saying that we should embrace those things in our life? No. Am I saying that we should go out and sin, that grace should abound? No. I'm saying sin is not our master. God is our master. Righteousness is our master. But I'm saying our walk is a walk of faith. It's not a walk of all of our works. It's a walk of faith. Faith will produce different works. Faith will produce different actions. All right? But it's a walk of our faith and our dependence upon God. Let me just say it this way. Maybe this will help you understand. Maybe, it'll, maybe it won't help you to understand. See, I have a perception of myself. But you know what? You have a perception of me that may be different than my perception. We've all got a per- Perception of ourselves, of what we think about us. And then there's another perception that people have of us. And usually the perception we have of ourselves is not the same perception that somebody else has of us. Somebody else might say, you know what, that person is is this and that, and I and you start pointing out all the faults of that person, and but the person says, doesn't even see those faults. Doesn't even see those failures. Or we could reverse it all around. I'm just saying that I'm just saying that in our humanity, we never see truth as truth is. We only see truth as what we conceive truth to be. You know, you can believe something, and to you it's the truth, but it's no truth in it. But to you it's truth, so to you it's truth. And somebody else believes something the very opposite, and to them it is absolute truth. Because that's what they believe, so that's truth to them. But did you know God is the only one that's truth? And your perception is not truth, and that other person's perception is not truth, but God's perception is absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. 
So our perception must line up with his perception. And sometimes, even in studying the Bible or whatever, we get a, some kind of perception that's not necessarily God's perception. Because we're looking at it through our colored glasses, so to speak. I think I, would, I gave Quentin a ride today to, to the school, and we were talking not exactly about this, but it came up. You know, Isaiah 55 says, God says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, and neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. But yet the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And I said to Quentin, well, obviously, we have the mind of Christ, but not the brain of Christ. Because <laughs> my thoughts say this, and it's probably way off the perception of God's thoughts. You know, God even used Isaiah 55 and to quote it in Romans uh, chapter 11, I think it is, that who, who, who shall counsel the Lord? Who shall ever come to him and say, uh, and teach him something? You know? And that's a lot of the things that's going on in Romans uh, chapter, that's in chapter 11, I think, but Romans chapter 9 is saying the same thing. People were saying, God, you're not fair. You can't do this. You can't do that, da, da, da. And, and God, you, you know, it's kind of like all of jo Job and all of his friends trying to say, well, you know, if you do this and this and this and then this and and they're, they're, all of their perceptions were wrong. Who was right? Only God. Only God is right. All right. So what am I saying about this? I'm saying that in our humanity, that uh, all of us do not see things totally clearly. And so I'm just saying, if it wasn't for the redeeming work of Christ, I could have no standing before him. I really couldn't, and you couldn't either. And the bottom line is this. He's going to save you by grace. If you're going to be saved at all, you're going to be saved by grace. You know, I spent several hours last weekend with some Jehovah Witnesses down at a Mexican restaurant, and uh, I spent several hours with them, and we were talking. And, uh, you know, all of their uh, their doctrine about works. And I can understand their doctrine. Faith without works is dead. If you don't have works to back up your faith, your faith is dead. And, that, and they were coming from that perspective. They were coming from that perspective. And I said, that is absolutely true. But sometimes we try to make those works our own standard of what we think, not of what God sees, but of what we think. And so the bottom line, I told these Jehovah Witnesses, the bottom line was this. I said, uh, it was, his name was Robert and Ray. I said, let me ask you something. Because they were really stressing that point, you know. Uh, they really, really uh, they weren't stressing at any other point than you see in, in, the, in the Pentecostal charismatic movement of evangelicals. They were just saying, without holiness, no man will see God. I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, you've got to be set apart with God and your faith has to demonstrate something. I didn't have a problem with any of that that they were saying, but the way that they were emphasizing it was that it was, it was you live up to their standard or you won't enter into the kingdom is what it amounted to. And finally I said, I want to ask you something, Robert. I said, do you ever sin? Yes, I do. Well, what do you do when you sin? I confess my sin before Jehovah. I said, okay, and is, is he faithful and just to forgive you those sins? And he said, yes. And I said, then your sins are forgiven then based upon the redeeming ransom work of Jesus Christ and his blood shed on the cross. And he said, yes, it's true. And I said, well, then can't you see that the way he saves you then is by grace? Can't you see that the way that he saves you is by grace? You said you couldn't live perfect. You do sin, and you sin, and you confess it. Jesus' blood forgives you of those sins. Can't you see that the only way that you will be saved is by his grace? I think they walked away from there with a little different perspective.
Let's go on here. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God the Father made Jesus Christ to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That we might be made the righteousness of God in and through Him. Question number four, Colossians 1, 21 and 22. Colossians 1, 21 and 22. And you who are sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, ye now have been reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy, unblameable, unreprovable in his sight through the body of his flesh through death God presents you holy, unblameable. That means blameless, unreprovable. That means there's no accusation can come against you in God's sight. So the question in question number four is this. Jesus Christ came to earth and died for our sins. Because because of this, we stand in God's presence as people who are holy, faultless, and innocent in a In your spouse's sight. B, in your friend's sight. Or C, in God's sight. Amen? In God's sight. Ephesians 1 6 says this. To the praise of the glory of God's grace, wherein he hath made us accepted. Let me say it. Wherein he hath made us accepted. Who's he? God hath made you accepted. Say it again. He, God, hath made you accepted. Not rejected. Accepted. How did he make you accepted? The last three words in verse 6. In the beloved, in Christ. He's the beloved one. Okay, question number five. We will praise God throughout all eternity for his grace because he hath made us accepted. The answer is accepted in Christ, accepted in the beloved. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. We've talked about this a lot. For by one offering, first, question number six, By one offering, he has perfected forever those that are set apart to God, those that are sanctified. Question number six. Through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross, we have been perfected for how long? A, until you sin again. B, until you go to church. C, until you pay your tithes. D, until you, et cetera, et cetera. C, forever. By one offering... By right, Jesus' sacrifice of the cross, we've been perfected. The answer is forever. As we place our trust and faith in Him. What if I was, what if I was perfected only until the next time I sin? Well, then we need to have church service 24 hours a day because I need to come to the altar 24 hours a day. Amen? I hope you don't get this wrong. I'm not giving a license to sin. Go out and do what you want. I'm saying faith in Christ, redemption, in Christ himself, in what he has accomplished, in what he has done. Or I can put faith in my works, my faith in my ability to jot every tittle and dot every I. That's a righteousness of the law, depending on myself, depending on on my own righteousness. It's very subtle. See, it's through the sacrifice of Jesus that we've been made accepted. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 through 17. It says, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after he said before, This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Question number seven. In the new covenant, God promises to remember our sins, A, every time we commit one, B, when we don't pay our tithes, or C, no more. C, no more. 
See, no more. <laughs> Taco Bell. <laughs> you know, here's the problem about teaching grace. Here's the problem about teaching the new covenant is that in 30 minutes or 45 minutes, you don't have time to bring out a balance to all of the scripture. So you have to emphasize one point. I am emphasizing today that you are made righteous through the redeeming work of Christ and not through your works. I might have to come back tomorrow and talk about your works. In fact, we probably will come back tomorrow and talk about your works. But right now we're talking about how is a man made righteous. When we talk about works, we're talking about the fruit of faith, the fruit of regeneration, the fruit of conversion. Right now we're not talking, we're, we're talking how to be saved, not who is saved. We're talking about how to get saved. And the only way to be saved is to be saved by grace through faith. That not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is not of your works, lest you should boast. Question number eight, Romans 6, 1 and 2. Just for the balance, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound or increase? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Question number eight, God's grace is greater than our sin. Shall we continue in sin so that God's grace can be shown to be great? No. There's been a death to sin. It's caused by grace. I don't want to talk too much about that. We'll talk about that later. Question number nine, Hebrews chapter nine, verse 12 says this, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. What kind of redemption, freedom from the penalty of our sins, did Jesus obtain for us? A, temporal redemption, B, partial redemption, or C, eternal redemption. And the answer is C, eternal redemption. Do you know how strong the sacrifice of Jesus really is? Question number 10. Read Romans 8, 33. Who shall lay anything, anything, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? God's chosen ones. It is God that justifieth. It is not you that justifies yourself. It's not man that justifies yourself. It's not your works that justifies you. It says God justifies you. And the question is, who shall lay anything to the charge of those that God has justified to God's elect? Question number 10, name someone who can bring a charge against God's chosen people. A, the devil, B, yourself, C, your spouse, et cetera, et cetera. The answer is no one can lay a charge against God's chosen ones. What am I emphasizing today in this lesson? The strength of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. The strength of what he did when he went to the cross and died there and rose again. I am not justifying people's actions or sinful behavior or any of those things, but I'm trying to say, say to you, all mankind, anyone that's going to be saved or ever saved is going to be saved by the grace of God. The law applied to any of our life at any moment in our life will show us sinfulness, but the gospel will make us righteous. Question number 11. Name someone who condemned, that is to bring judgment on God's people. Romans 8, 34. Who, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather is risen again, who is at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Look at verse 34. The question is, who can condemn? Who can bring judgment upon God's people? It's not Christ. Christ is the one that died. I'm going to read something to you real quickly because I only have less than five minutes. This is a message by H.A. Ironside. Who's ever heard of him? Harry Ironside? He's a famous uh, 
minister, he, he spoke on this on April 24th, 1934, okay, in the D.L. Moody Memorial Church on, on Sunday morning. I just want to read this. This is Romans chapter 8, the, the latter part of Romans there. There's, there's a question and the answer, and this really touched me when I read this, and I want to share this with you. The question is this. If you have your Bibles, you can look at it. Romans 8, 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? That is the question. Who shall separate you from the love of Christ? That is your question. Can the devil separate you from the love of Christ? Can your friend separate you from the love of Christ? Can you, uh, anyone else separate you from the love of Christ? That is the question. Now, this is the answer. The answer is in Romans 8, 38 and 39. Look at this. For I, Paul said, I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I just want to read this. Listen to what it's saying here. Once we have been justified by faith, who is there? What power is there that can separate us from the love of Christ? The answer is how full, how clear, not a shadow, not a doubt, not a question left when the apostle says, neither death nor life shall separate you from the love of Christ. Now listen to what he says here. Can you think of anything which is neither included in death nor in life? Can you think of anything that's not included in death or in life? It says nothing in life or nothing in death can separate you from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I'm going to just read on. I just got a couple of minutes here. No unseen powers can separate the believer from Christ, neither angels nor principalities nor powers. These terms are used again and again in the New Testament, particularly in the epistles for angels, uh, angelic host, good and evil. When our Savior rose from the dead, he spoiled principalities and powers. That is, he defeated all the host of evil led by Satan. And so we may take it that angels referred to here are good angels and that principalities and powers are possible evil angels. Here's the statement I want you to get. But there is nothing that good angels would do and there's nothing that evil angels can do which will result in the separation of the believer from Christ. There's nothing that good angels can do and there's nothing that demonic spirits can do that can separate the believer from the love of God that's in Christ. Let me read on. And then further it says, neither things present nor things to come. Let me put a question to you. Can you think of any experience through which a believer might ever go which is neither a thing present nor a thing to come? Is there anything you experience that's not present nor a thing to come? As the Holy Ghost says, neither things present nor things to come shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing today and nothing tomorrow. And did you know what? If I, could, if I walked out of here today and fell over in the hall dead of a heart attack, there's nothing today and nothing tomorrow that would separate me from his love. Nothing in life and nothing in death that will separate me. I'm just turning on to the other side. His love will be there for me and for you. One other thing, as though that were not enough, he speaks in a more general way when he says neither height nor depth. That means nothing in heaven and nothing in hell nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. Height or depth, who shall descend into the deep to raise up Christ from the earth? Nothing in heaven above, nothing in hell beneath can ever separate us from the love of Christ. 
Now, I hope today you understood the message correctly today, but the message today was to bring you comfort. Amen? Confidence, comfort, trust. Walk with him. He walks with you. Amen? God bless you and have a good day.